します。Good afternoon from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett. You see the background there? The, yes. the, the beach is empty because of Corona. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we have the pleasure of having um, Ahmed Adnan, a neurosurgeon from Baghdad, Iraq, uh, who I just found out did a fellowship with uh, Dr. Sabaya, another uh, teacher on this uh, on network. Anyways, Ahmad's going to talk about surgical classification of colloid cysts, and I'll let him take it over. Welcome, Ahmad. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, this is a great opportunity and great chance for me uh, to present my uh, experience in colloid cyst. I did more than 52 cases of colloid cyst, and I noticed that there is some confusion about the classifications of the colloid cyst. Some of them are of academic interest, other of pathological interest, other of radiological interest, but I saw that there is very little attention about the real problem of the colloid cyst, which is the surgical problem. What about the types of colloid cysts that we are facing during surgery? Each neurosurgeon during his career in working in the colloid cyst, he is expecting to find the colloid cyst in a very specific location and in a very specific stereotyped fashion in the lateral and third ventricle. But this is not always the case. Sometimes the neurosurgeon, even the expert neurosurgeon, will be faced by some difficulties in surgically treating cases of colloid cyst. I will pay attention about the transcalusal approach. I did many, many endoscopic approach, but I uh, stopped, in fact, doing endoscopic procedures because I, I think that removal of the colloid cyst wall is rather difficult and sometimes so dangerous to be done endoscopically. And then I switched all of my cases to transcalusal approach. So this surgical classification is based on experience of more than 50 cases, and all of them, they are done through transcalusal approach. Okay, let me start now with the data show. I have to share my screen now. Okay. Perfect. As a, a routine introduction for the colloid cyst, it is in fact, although it is rare uh, type of brain lesions or brain tumors, some consider them as a, consider it as a brain tumor, but it is the most common lesion that's located within the third ventricle. But as a whole, it represents 0.3 to 2% of all of the intracranial tumors. So not all neurosurgeons have a good exposure to the colloid cyst. And this gives me the justification to put a surgical classification because many, many neurosurgeons, even the expert, will not face colloid cyst once per week or even once per a month. Because of this rarity in the uh, uh, surgery of the colloid cyst, this necessitates the surgical classification so the surgeon will be aware about the different surgical types of the colloid cyst. Uh, usually it presents in the second and fifth decades of life, though it had been recorded as a case of colloid cyst in two months in fact, but usually its presentation in the young periods. All of us are familiar with the presentations of the colloid cyst. They are usually presented with headache, but uh, sometimes the headache takes a paroxysmal type of headache that is changed with the head posture. This had been postulated by some neurosurgeons as the commonest presentation, but in fact, in a meta-analysis of the presentations of colloid cyst, this type of presentation is found rather rare and it is based on a theoretical uh, fact that the colloid cyst might be pedunculated in the roof of the third ventricle. So when the patient lying flat on the bed, he will have a partially opened Monroe, and when he sits or stands, the Monroe will be closed, giving the explanation of the paroxysmal headache that is changed according to the patient's position. But this is theoretical, and it is not in the majority of the patients. Most of the patients, they presented with a chronic headache, 
blurred vision, vomiting, features of raised intracranial pressure. Another interesting finding is sudden drop attack. They will lose the powers in both of the legs without loss of consciousness. This is also notified in patients with colloid cysts. Some of the patients, especially uh, over the age of uh, 50s, they can present with dementia. And of course, all of us, we are aware about the rare presentations of colloid cysts with sudden death. Rarely, <clears throat> less than 3% of colloid cyst populations, they can present with sudden death. Radiologically, there are two types of colloid cysts. There is hyperdense colloid cyst, which is considered as the majority of the cases, nearly about 60 to 70 percent. They have hyperdense colloid cysts that is close to the density of the bone, as you can see here. This is the majority, the hyperdense colloid cyst, when there is a lot of calcium particles deposited within the colloid cyst. Of course, this type of colloid cyst predict that it is highly vicious and it is difficult to be aspirated through the catheter if one thinks of the endoscopic treatment. There is another type, which is the isodense or even hypodense colloid cyst that represents 30 to 20% of the cases. So these are two types that are based on CT scan. On MRI, also they are variable, uh, heterogeneous sometimes, but the classifications is based on the CT scan. Some of the radiological classifications also depends on the location of the colloid cyst. Now, as I said, my experience is based on more than 50 cases of colloid cysts treated over a period of uh, more than 10 years. This is here wrong, this is 2020. And uh, most of the presentations were, were headache. Uh, two patients presented as a features of non-pressure hydrocephalus, and one patient presented comatose at the emergency room. Procedures, the transcalusal approach. It is a classic teaching for transcalusal approach to put the craniotomy flap two thirds in the front of the coronal suture, one third behind the coronal suture, and you can use a varieties of skin incision to achieve this goal of two thirds behind, one third anterior to the coronal suture, and you have to cross to the other side so that you have a control on the midline. This is the classic teaching. Then, after repeated experience, we notice that this is not necessary. It is not needed to go behind the coronal suture. You can put the whole flap anterior to the coronal suture, and you can put the coronal suture just on the posterior margin of your craniotomy. This has two advantages. First, of course, you are away, much, much away from the motor cortex than two thirds, one third concepts. And second, even when you face a bridging veins and you cannot negotiate, of course, you should exhaust yourself to preserve the bridging veins, but sometimes it is not possible. Then, anterior to the coronal sutures, there are two anatomical points. The space between the middle and anterior frontal veins is rather large. And second, if you sacrifice the anterior frontal veins, then in the majority of the patients, nothing will happen. So putting the craniotomy anterior to the coronal suture, first, you are away from the motor cortex. Second, you have like more likely chance not to encounter an important vein. Of course, preoperative MRV is of great help, and preoperative neuronavigation is also of great help in designing your flap. So this is our flap, a linear incision of eight centimeters that's located just on the coronal suture. You can fill it over the scalp and you put the craniotomy through one borehole that's located in the midline. Here you can put a borehole in the midline because the inner surface of the skull is flat. So the borehole will disengage safely while posteriorly you cannot put a borehole in the midline because the inner surface of the skull is rather triangular. So the burr hole will not disengage posteriorly and it will damage the sinus. But anterior to the coronal suture, the skull, inner surface of the skull is rather flat, making the disengagement of the burr hole perforator safe. So put one burr hole at the coronal suture 
And then you can do a circular craniotomy that is flanking two sides, most predominantly on the right side, which is our usual exposure. So you have a full exposure of the superior sagittal sinus, some of the exposure on the left side, and the majority of the exposure on the right side. Here the distance is four to five centimeters. The dural opening is three centimeters, quite sufficient, not only to remove the colloid cyst, but to remove of the majorities of the tumors in the body and in the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle and through transforaminal approach to the third ventricle, three centimeters dural flap is quite sufficient. So the whole craniotomy is five centimeters, three centimeters is the dural flap that's reflected toward the superior sagittal sinus. Of course, needless to say that the dura has to be opened under the microscope so you can exhaust your effort to preserve all of the bridging veins. The neural navigator that's based on preoperative MRV is quite helpful in order to fashion your dural incision. Okay, you can see our evolution. This is from my patients early. I did this flap because I need to expose a very large area. I have to encounter one third behind the coronal suture, two thirds anterior to the coronal suture, crossing to the other side, and I did this skin incision. Then after repeated experience, I changed to a linear incision that is located exactly over the coronal suture, and it is one-third on one side, two-thirds on the other side, but entirely anterior to the coronal suture. This is the midline, one-third on one side, two-thirds on the other side at the pre-coronal area. Of course, using the intraoperative neurophysiology, sometimes of help if you uh, put an uh, unnecessary retraction on the calusa marginal, or pericalusal arteries, then the neurophysiologist using the somatosensory and motor evoke potential can alarm you. Here, how we reflect the dura toward the superior sagittal sinus and look to the importance of the exposure of the superior sagittal sinus because you have a dura retraction and some deviation of the superior sagittal sinus giving you a good corridor in the interhemispheric fissure. This distance from the anterior to the posterior margin of the dural incision is not more than three centimeters. And then you will go to the corpus callosum where you need to cut not more than two centimeters and it is asymptomatic. Here is our trajectory. This is the coronal suture. As I said, we opened the craniotomy here. So your trajectory will be pre-coronal. And then you have the tragus. If you are on the pre-coronal area, toward the tragus, then you open the corpus callosum, two centimeters, and you will be online with the form of Monroe. It is very common to open posterior, so you will see the choroid plexus, and then you have to extend your callosal incision more and more anteriorly. I never encountered open more anterior. At the early experience, I thought that if I did a linear incision with small craniotomy, then perhaps I will go toward the genu. But this is not true. I'm always either backward or at the form of Monroe. So don't be afraid that if you put the craniotomy far anterior, you will reach the genu. No, you will reach to the form of Monroe, or more often than not, you can encounter the choroid plexus. Then you have to follow it anteriorly toward the, the form of Monroe. But in this situation, perhaps you need to extend some of the callosal incision. If you open, two to three centimeters in the corpus callosum, then it is usually asymptomatic. There is no dissociation symptoms because this part of the corpus callosum connects the prefrontal cortices on both sides, which have many uh, intercortical connections that can compensate for this minor deficits in the corpus callosum. Okay, let's let us to review some of the important anatomical facts. I will pay attention to these three veins. In fact, we have 12 veins. 
that are drained from the superior surface of the hemisphere toward the superior sagittal sinus. The majority of these veins are located between the coronal suture and lambdoid suture. There are no bridging veins below the lambdoid sutures in the majority of the human beings. And there are little veins anterior to the coronal suture, or there are good space between the posterior frontal vein and the middle frontal vein anterior to the coronal suture. You can see here, you have a good space between the posterior and the middle frontal veins. Here it's more representative picture. This is the coronal suture. You can see this is the middle frontal vein and this is the posterior frontal vein. You can see the distance between the middle frontal vein and the posterior frontal vein. This is nearly constant in the human beings. Good distance, compare this distance with this one. This is the vein of Trollard with the posterior frontal vein is very little, while the posterior frontal vein with the middle frontal vein, you have a great distance. Put it on the other words, that anterior to the coronal suture, in the majority of the human beings, you have a free space. Sometimes you have a small vein, you can negotiate, you can open the arachnoid, so you can put the vein under stretch. Even if you put the vein under maximum stretch, some of the veins that they can tolerate stretch instead of sacrificing it, depending on this fact of distance between the middle and the posterior frontal veins. Here are the steps. First is the exposure. Of course, this is cadaveric from the Great Book of Watum. And then going interhemispherically, sometimes the hemispheres, they are quite adherent to each other at the level of singulate gyri. We call it interdigitations of singulate gyri. And this is quite apparent on MRI, especially T2 MRI and PLAR MRI. You can assess the adhesions between the singulate gyri, which makes the interhemispheric approach rather tedious and takes a great care and attention from the neurosurgeon to separate the two singulate gyri. You have to distinguish between the callosal marginal artery and pellicarlosal arteries. Some of the neurosurgeons first will encounter the callosal marginal artery, then he will think that he will encounter the corpus callosum immediately below the callosal marginal artery. This is, of course, wrong. You have to go downward in the interhemispheric fashion to encounter two parallel pericallusal arteries. This is standards in 80% of the cases, but sometimes you have a single artery and a zygous pericallusal artery that gives supply to both, both hemispheres. So you need to find a space between the branches to open the corpus callosum. Here until you reach to the corpus callosum, then you do the callosotomy. And as I, as I said, the callosotomy, you have the coronal suture here, anterior to the coronal suture, about one centimeter, toward the tragus, do the callosotomy, two centimeters or two, two and a half centimeters, then you will see the form of Monroe. Classically, that's thought, and this is the core of our subject. Once you see the form of Monroe, then your plan is that you will see the form of Monroe that is closed by the colloid cyst. The form of Monroe is looking toward you, but it is closed in the colloid cyst. If you look here, this is as if it is an eye that's looking toward you, but it is closed in the colloid cyst. This is usual type of colloid cyst. We call it open Monroe colloid cyst. And this where the majority of the neurosurgeons is expecting to find. And this is the picture that's always put in the endoscopic treatment of colloid cyst. They would put an endoscopic image that shows an open Monroe that is only closed by part of the colloid cyst wall. So this is from Rotten's book. You can see that he is demonstrating the classic appearance of the colloid cyst when you did callosotomy in the proper place. Then you expect to find a uh, form of Monroe. Of course, you can know the form of Monroe by following the choroid plexus. And then you see that the 
front Monroe is looking toward you. Open Monroe. The furnaces are separated from the head of Calgate's nucleus and the thalamus. Open Monroe, but it is closed by the colloid cyst. In fact, this in our work presents only in 70% of the cases. So you might do colloid cyst operation and you will not face such a situation, classic situation. Then you will be in a trouble if you are not prepared for this type of colloid cyst. And this is the classic type. You will identify the colloid cyst, then you will open it, evacuate of its content, and then dissecting the wall microsurgically from the surrounding fornix and the head of cavity nucleus, thalamus, the thalamus triad vein, and the choroid plexus with the superior choroidal vein and medial posterior choroidal arteries, and then remove the colloid cyst totally. This is the usual story. So now what are the surgical types? The surgical types, type one, which is the classic type, the commonest type that I just described is the open mineral. This is one of my cases. If you do cholesiotomy, then immediately you see the front of Monroe that is looking toward you, but it is closed by part of the wall of the colloid cyst. Then classically, you will open it, evacuate it, resect the wall, as we will see in this case. This is a 30 years old female presented with features of severe headache and blurred vision. She has got this type of hyperdense colloid cyst. Here you can see the point that I emphasized early, the interdigitation of the cingulate gyri. If you look here in the coronal MRI, T2, T2 sorry, at the level of the colloid cyst, you can see that the fox end here and below it, there are no clear separations between the cingulate gyri. They are quite adherent. And there is a rather complex relationship between the callosal marginal and pericallusal arteries. So this predicts that you will have some problems in separating of the cingulate gyri at the level of the colloid cyst. Okay, now I have to show you the video of the classic type of the colloid cyst. Yes. You see here? It's here good. And okay. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, thank you. You see here that there is great adhesion between the singular gyri. You have to be prepared about this point, not to be surprised during surgery. Look for the MRI, look carefully for every study, then separate, spend good time to separate the cingulate gyri between each other. And you can do it from inside to outside as you open the sylvian fissure. Open a small area, expose the strikingly white corpus callosum, and then go from inside to outside as you open the sylvian fissure. Then callosotomy, of course you can use, oh, look here, open Monroe. The form of Monroe is an eye that's looking toward you. It is separated from the head of caudate nucleus. Very thick. Of course, to me, this is not for endoscopy. There is no way to resect, unless you are using endoscopic CUSA that I have no experience with it. So, evacuate it by sucker, by dissector, by uh, biopsy forceps. And then after evacuation, you have to I'll remove the wall, as you can see, separating the wall from the roof of the third ventricle at the level of the fornix. This is the fornix. Here we are dissecting the wall. This will guarantee no recurrence. You can see this is the attachment of the colloid cyst wall on the roof of the third ventricle. Now the monroe is opened and this slit-like third ventricle. So this is the classic type. Every neurosurgeon expects when he opened the corpus callosum to face this type of colloid cyst. To, have, to see the form of Monroe after you follow the choroid plexus and then to see that it is closed 
partially by the role of the colloid cyst. But this is not always the case, as you will see in the other types of the colloid cysts. So, so this is the first type, and it is the commonest type in our series in about 70% of the cases. So now I will go back to... Okay. So this is the post-operative image, total resection. I followed this patient for the last 10 years. She is very good. She has no any recurrence. There is another type of colloid cyst. We call it interfornicial colloid cyst, where the colloid cyst is not located here. You are not expecting, after you did pelizotomy, to see the colloid cyst through an open form of mineral. The colloid cyst will be located here, between the furnaces, and it will open the space for you in the interfornicial fashion. So if you go through the form of mineral, you will fail to remove it. So here you have to change your policy a little bit posteriorly between the two furnaces. Of course, by the pathology itself, the interfornicial space will be open. We call it interfornicial colloid cyst. And you will see, this is the picture. Here after I did colosotomy, you can see the fourth moon rose quite anterior. It is here, if you are seeing um, my arrow. Posterior to it, you have this right fornix, and this is left fornix, and here is the colloid cyst in the area that's called vilum interpositum. So the vilum interpositum hosts the colloid cyst and splayed laterally, not only the furnaces, but the internal cerebral veins, the medial posterior choroidal arteries. And the choroid plexus of the third ventricle is attached on the inferior surface of the colloid cyst. This is not foraminal. If you go through the foramen, you cannot remove the colloid cyst because the majority of it is located posteriorly. If you pull it, then you will damage the medial posterior choroidal arteries and internal cerebral veins. So you have to go in the interfornicial fashion. Here is another static picture. After I did colosotomy, this is the colosotomy. Then you will have, this is the right fornix, this is the left fornix that is opened by retro, by the interfornicial, sorry, interfornicial colloid cyst. Sometimes you have cavum septum pellucidum and sometimes you don't have cavum septum pellucidum. But what is constant is that the colloid cyst is rather posteriorly, but in the midline, separating the two furnaces from each other. And it's located in the vilum interpositum, laterally located are the internal cerebral veins, medial posterior choroidal arteries, and the choroid plexus is attached on the inferior surface of the colloid cyst. So it's very easy. You have to come in the interfernicial fashion because the pathology itself opens this pathway for you. And you see this. This is septum pellucidum that ends with one fornix. This is septum pellucidum that ends with another fornix. So there is no meaning going transforaminal. Here, you have to put your calisotomy in the same location, but you have to look backward by tilting the head a little bit downward. So you can see the colloid cyst. That's what's called the cavum septum pellucidum, as I said, that it's not always existing, but you can see the separated furnaces. Sometimes you'll be surprised, not evident on MRI. And I now will show you the video. Because of this important, I will show two videos for the interfornicial. Now this is the calisotomy. Here you can see colloid cyst. Right fornix, left fornix. The form of Monroe is far anterior. We are a little bit posterior. So opening the vilum interpositum and the wall of the colloid cyst, resecting. And then you can see that the choroid plexus is attached on the inferior surface. Of course, this colloid, this choroid plexus is of the third ventricle. And here is the cavity of the third ventricle. Then resecting the wall with the choroid, choroid plexus from the right fornix. But here it is very vascular. We are, here we are very posterior. 
and then resected it from the left fornix and then posteriorly. So evacuating the midline, resecting from the right, resecting from the left, and resecting posteriorly. Of course, it is meaningless to evacuate the colloid cyst because it will recur. You have to excise the wall. Here we are excising the wall with the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. You can see this is the fornix of the left side, this fornix on the right side. And this is the interfornicial approach that is already opened by the colloid cyst. The fourth Monroe is far anteriorly. We call this type interfornicial colloid cyst. We distinguish this from another type of colloid cyst, which is called retrofaraminal. Why? Because this is the midline and it opens the pathway in the interfornicial fashion. While there is another type of colloid cyst, which is called retrofornicial, we call it. It is not in the midline. It is eccentric on one of the form of Monroe, but behind it, hiding behind one of the furnaces. And this is the other type. Okay, I will skip the other video because of the time. So this is the post-operative image. You can see the two furnaces that are preserved. The patient has intact memory and our approach is interfornicial that's already created by the colloid cyst. The third type of colloid cyst is called, we call it retroforaminal, where you will open and you will see just normal anatomy. You will follow the choroid plexus. You will see an open form of Monroe, nothing wrong with it. There is no colloid cyst. There are no colloid cysts in the interfornicial fashion, so you think you bring the, the wrong patient. There is no colloid cyst. This type is retrofornicial colloid cyst, and this can be treated either by transchoroidal approach through the tinea fornices or tinea choroidi, or interfornicial approach anteriorly. And I will show you one case. Look for this. After cholesatomy, you have quite normal anatomy. This is a patient with colloid cyst. Where is the colloid cyst? Open front of Monroe, fornix, choroid plexus. And here is the head of the caudate nucleus, the column of the fornix. No colloid cyst. The colloid cyst, in fact, is retrofornicial. It is here. Retroforaminal, sorry. Retroforaminal. It is not interfornicial. It is retroforaminal. And this is one of the cases. Small colloid cyst with massive hydrocephalus. Here is the MRI. Colloid cyst with hydrocephalus because of the closure posterior to front Monroe. This is front Monroe. Opened, but posterior to it, it is closed. And look here, the cingulate gyri are nicely separated. So this expects an easy transcalusal approach where there are no interdigitations of the cingulate gyri. And here I should go to the video again. Uh, yes. If you look to the initial picture, look here, we preserve the vein. Then callosotomy. Easy separated cingulate gyri. Immediately the corpus callosum will be apparent. And here, nice parallel pericallusal artery doing the callosotomy at the designated position. And we are expecting an open Monroe colloid cyst, but we will be surprised when the callosotomy is completed. Just empty from Monroe. You can introduce the dissector, nothing. So here you go a little bit backward. In the transchoroidal fashion here, and you can see the colloid cyst. So it is behind, here is the Monroe. It is behind the Monroe. And I think if you go endoscopically, it is again difficult to remove this type of colloid cyst. Again, it is removed in both of its contents and its wall. 
this patient experienced a transient memory disturbances, special short-term memory, that is resolved in a matter of three weeks. Here it is removed totally with its wall. The Monroe is anterior. This is retroforaminal type of colloid cyst. Here, some remnants of the wall that cannot be removed is coagulated. And I followed this patient for the last five years, and he's okay. Okay. The last type of colloid cyst that I encountered, these are surgical types. These are types that are useful during surgery. So it makes you mentally prepared not to be surprised by a variety of colloid cysts, not that you are expecting. Because as I emphasized early, colloid cyst is not a weekly operation for every neurosurgeon. Some of the neurosurgeons perhaps will not see colloid cyst every two to three months. So he has one mental image of colloid cyst is that there is open Monroe and the colloid cyst cyst on the Monroe. Here we show some of the colloid cysts, in fact, the rarest type of colloid cyst. We call it closed Monroe, and this is most confusing, and to us is most dangerous, because you have lost your orientation in the ventricle. Of course, the neural navigation is useless after you evacuate the CSF, and you might damage a very critical structures like the fornix, head of caudate nucleus, and thalamus. Here, the colloid cyst is located at the level of Monroe. But the colloid cyst pushes the fornix toward the head of caudate nucleus, closing it, and pushes this side, closing it. So once you will open the corpus callosum, what you will see is a featureless white ball. You will just see a bulge, a white bulge that faced you. You don't know what's this white bulge that is faced you. In fact, this is the bold fornix that is bowed toward you by the colloid cyst where closing the Monroe. So the, it is at the level of Monroe, but the Monroe is closed. It's not like these eyes that's looking toward you. Both of these eyes are closed by the colloid cyst. We call it closed Monroe colloid cyst. In this type of colloid cyst, in fact, the fornices, they are fused with each other. There is no way to go into a because you will damage both of them. So what you need to do, you have to be aware that you are facing a closed Monroe colloid cyst. Look for the choroid plexus, if possible. And then you can gently, with using of patties, retracting the fornix, opening the Monroe, converting a closed Monroe colloid cyst into an open Monroe colloid cyst. Sometimes you need to open very tiny opening in the fornix, just a puncture, aspirate some of the colloid cyst, making the body of the fornix to relax, and this will partially open the fourth Monroe, put a retractor over the fourth Monroe, and then proceed as a usual transforaminal approach. Okay, look for this image. Here, after you are doing colosotomy, you will face a featureless whitish bulge, nothing. Of course, this whitish bulge will span all of your exposure. You will not get away from this bulge. Either you go medial or lateral, forward, backward, just a bulge. And you have no full appreciation what this bulge. Needless to say, this is normal. This is not the wall of the colloid cyst. You cannot open it. This is a fornix that is swollen, pushed by the, by the colloid cyst, Closing the Monroe. Here is the Monroe, but it is closed. So what you need to do, just open the Monroe, put a retractor on the fornix, then open partially the Monroe, and then you can remove the colloid cyst. And we will have the video for this very important type This is a rather long video, but I will make it short. Here we are opening. Look, 
featureless ball after you did cholesotomy. Nothing. Then you need to retract. And then you can see once you retract, retract the fornix, you can open the form of Monroe. So here the form of Monroe is close to the head of caudate nucleus. Here you put a retractor, not on the head of caudate nucleus, not on the thalamus, but very gently on the fornix to convert a closed Monroe into open Monroe. Look, it's closed again. Open the Monroe. And then once you open it, still you can see the form of Monroe is vertical, not in the usual fashion looking toward you. Then very gradually delivering the wall and evacuating the content. Here is the wall. Very big colloid. Here is the fornix. Delivering the wall, exposing more contents, removal of the contents, delivering the wall in this cyclical fashion, and dissect very gently the arteries and the veins that are adherent to the wall of the colloid cyst. Here is a branch of the medial posterior choroidal artery. Partially resecting the wall. It is very large colloid cyst. Some of the contents, they are thick and need to be removed by the sector, the spout. You see, you need to retract the fornix. Now the form of Monroe is opened after resection of significant amount of the colloid cyst. Look here, there's thick content. You need to dislodge it and then take it out. So you should be mentally prepared that there is one type of colloid cyst that you will face where once you do chalizotomy, you will just face a whitish bulge. That's in fact the whitish bulge that you will immediately encounter is the swollen fornix, just retracted very gently toward you and then you will open the Monroe. It is usually seen when you have large colloid cysts. We encounter six types of this closed Monroe colloid cyst. Some of the types, the Monroe is not totally closed. This is totally closed Monroe, but some, they are partially closed. Here, there is some of the veins that are attached to the posterior wall of the colloid cyst. Again, deliver some of the wall, remove the content, dissect the wall microsurgically, from the roof of the third ventricle. Be careful about all of the adherent vessels. Put the patty in the third ventricle so blood will not slip to the third ventricle. This is the fornix. You can see that the majority of the colloid cysts were pushing the fornix toward the head of caudate nucleus, closing by this the form of Monroe. Once you remove the contents, gradually the form of Monroe will be converted from a closed type into an open type. Here I make it a little bit faster.
a section of the wall. self irrigating bipolars, very useful, not to stick and to clear the pathway for you. And then, the whole colloid cyst wall had been removed. So, we have partially closed Look for this, transcalusal approach again, pericalusal arteries. Look here. This is from Monroe. It is not totally closed, but again, the bulge of the corpus of the fornix. In the previous case, the bulge is so severe that it closes the Monroe. Here it is partially closing the Monroe. So here you don't need to retract the fornix. You can open through this narrow corridor not classic open Monroe colloid cyst, partially closed. Then open it. The larger the cyst, the more fourth Monroe will be closed. Evacuating the contents and then resecting the wall. Resection of the wall is very important. And uh, in my opinion, uh, in a block resection of the wall is rather dangerous. Some of the neurosurgeons perhaps are advocating in a block resection of the colloid cyst, the wall and the contents in one hit using the endoscope. I don't think this is a safe procedure because as you can see that it is adherent to the medial posterior choroidal artery branches and to the superior choroidal veins and to the thalamocytriate veins. So I think microsurgical patient resection of the colloid cyst wall is much safer than evolving the uh, colloid cyst wall using the endoscope. I did endoscopic resection of the colloid cyst initially. Then I uh, have a feeling that microsurgical resection of the colloid cyst, especially with the existence of its surgical variation is much safer and perhaps much simpler than endoscopic procedure. Here you can see it is now open monroe. It was partially closed and now it is an open monroe. Okay, what about the review of articles? In fact, to the best of my knowledge, there is very little concern about the surgical types of the Colloid cyst. For example, in 2015, Joseph Osorio divided the colloid cyst in the third ventricle into three zones, zone one and zone two and zone three. Zone one is located from the column of the fornix back to the anterior septal vein here, and zone two from the anterior septal vein back to the medial arterial vein. And then zone three is posterior to the medial arterial vein but there is no any mentioning about interfornicial or retrofornicial types or closed Monroe or open Monroe types. Anyhow, these are some of the important classifications. And we do know that the anterior septal veins are not always constant in its location, sometimes located anterior to Monroe, sometimes posterior to Monroe. Anyhow, he divided the colloid cyst based on these three zones. Walid Azab, in 2000, so 2014, again he classified the colloid cyst into two types. One he called it the classic colloid cyst when it is located at the level of Fourth Monroe, and one he called it posterior colloid cyst when it's located on the posterior part of the third ventricle near the aqueduct. In fact, it is interfornicia in our classifications, but I don't think he, he had any notifications about the open Monroe, the closed Monroe, or the retroforaminal type of the colloid cyst. Now, lastly, I want to present this case. 
this had been presented to me as a case of colloid cyst. Of course, needless to say, this is not colloid cyst because colloid cyst is not enhancing. Sometimes the wall of the colloid cyst is enhancing, but the colloid cyst content never enhances. Only the wall, in some of the patients, it enhanced. Here you can see that there is intense homogeneous enhancement of a lesion that is on the location of the colloid cyst associated with this cyst. So this is the type of pilocytic astrocytoma. How we can approach it? We can approach it transcortical through this cyst, but you can see that the cyst is located on the left side. So going transcortical, you might violate the left frontal lobe. If you pay attention to the corpus callosum, then you can see that there is area in the corpus callosum in the body where the corpus callosum itself is missing. Open the pathway for you for the transcallosal approach. In fact, it is not transcallosal. There is no corpus callosum here. So it is interhemispheric. Here you can escape transcortical to the interhemispheric, making use of this point. There is absence of the body of the corpus callosum here. So you attack it in the interhemispheric fashion. And this is the post-operative image. And if I have time, I don't have time, I think. So uh, perhaps I have some time to show. This is an old video. Yes, we have plenty of time. OK. So you can see that this is the corpus callosum, anterior margin. This is the corpus callosum. Posterior margin here, sorry. There is missing of the corpus callosum. And so we make use of this uh, anatomical point that's created by this pilocytic astrocytoma to be resected through the interhemispheric fashion, not through the uh, transcortical fashion that perhaps uh, one can initially and intuitively think that it is better to go transcortical way, but it is on the left side, as I said, and there is already missing corpus callosum. And then you can see that it is resected circumferentially. It is not hemangioblastoma. It is pilocytic astrocytoma. Here we are in the interhemispheric fashion. This is corpus callosum. And here it is removed totally. So I just want to conclude the presentation. Colosis is the commonest third ventricular lesion that's usually located at the level of Mon front Monroe. We do think that transcalusal approach using simple linear incision of eight centimeter length at the pre-coronal area is considered ideal for all types of colloid cysts, whether you have hydrocephalus or you don't have hydrocephalus. There are four surgical subtypes, as I said, of colloid cyst. It is an open Monroe colloid cyst, closed Monroe colloid cyst, retrofaraminal and interfornicial colloid cysts, which can reach back to the cerebral aqueduct. Excision of colloid cysts is considered curative in the majority of the cases without shunts. Some of them, they need shunts. And this concludes my presentation, and thank you for your listening. I'm ready for any comments or any question. Okay, thank you very much, thank Dr. And, and, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Kubulo. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed Adnan. Thank you. Uh, for your brilliant presentation. Thank so, you. I'll be moderating this part of uh, the presentation. So, I'm a final year neurosurgical resident at the University of Zimbabwe, but I'm originally mm -hmm. from Congo. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank uh, you very much for, for your those who joined us. I just got a small issue here. I don't know if it's correct. Dr. Ahmad is from Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got his board in neurosurgery in uh, 2000, and he mm -hmm. did a combined fellowship in base of skull yes. surgery by Professor Shbe and uh, Dr. Sami under yes. the WFNS patronage. Mm -hmm. And currently, you are a consultant neurosurgeon in Neuroscience Hospital in Baghdad. Yes, I'm the head so of the department. Just to remind uh, people who joined during the meeting. Yeah. And uh, before we go further, I will ask Dr. Ahmed Amid, who has a comment and a question for you. Yes. Dr. Ahmed Amid. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I, can you hear me, please? 
Yes. Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ahmed for his uh, great presentation. Actually, it's, uh, it's putting uh, a new perspective to how to deal with such a rare cases with because he have uh, plenty of experience in in uh, this in these in those cases but uh, here what, what i want to ask uh, you you presented uh, us a new uh, surgical classification of the types of the cholecyst tumor but uh, i i want to know if we can utilize it more practically can we diagnose can we utilize any of these approaches before we can jump into surprise and uh, intraoperatively. What I mean, can we combine, for instance, endoscopic uh, utilization uh, with, the, with the microscope yes. to see what we are facing with or, or uh, correlated with, being, with imaging more, uh, with more Sorry, Dr. Atta can you mute yourself, please? Dr. Zimani? Okay. okay, you want me to ask or what? No, no, no. I, 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 I got your question. It's a very good question. Um, in fact, based on preoperative MRI and CT scan, uh, except in the variety of interfornicial type, uh, it is difficult to tell. I discussed many, many neurologists that can you tell me how is the state of the fourth Monroe? Is it opened? Is it closed? What is the cholecyst in relation to the Funk Monroe? And they have difficulties in giving you a good appreciation about the real anatomy of the cholecyst in relation to the Funk Monroe. So apart from the interfornicial type, the other types, the open Monroe, the closed Monroe, the, the retroforaminal, is difficult to be predicted based on preoperative uh, imaging. Perhaps we need special angles that are not yet uh, created or not yet invented. Perhaps we need special views, uh, special planes to see the form of Monroe from different directions. Perhaps we need 3D reconstruction of the brain by using high resolution MRI, three Teslas or even seven Tesla in order to have a good preoperative planning. But in the current studies, it is difficult to tell. So just be mentally prepared that you have different types of colloid cyst. Radiology, up to the, my best experience, not always giving you the correct anatomy of the colloid cyst. For this reason, I in fact switched from the endoscopic type to the uh, uh, transcalosal type. Of course, when there is hyperdense colloid cyst, uh, I will never think of endoscopy because hyperdense predicts a very thick contents of the colloid cyst and we don't have endoscopic CUSA. Uh, so I will immediately go for transcalosal when there is hyperdense colloid cyst. In the case of isodense or hyperdense colloid cyst, it is easy by endoscopy only when it is open Monroe. But if you have interfornicial, especially if you have closed Monroe colloid cyst, then the endoscopy perhaps is difficult, uh, in my hands at least to say. Well, thank you for your uh, welcome, welcome, Dr. Ahmed, and thank I you for your participation. I think it will be a great classification if we can utilize it. Uh, the, the yes. 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 Your your it can be utilized preoperatively. It can be very useful to select the uh, appropriate yes. approach for each uh, yes. type before the operation. Yes. So it's better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Any other questions? Uh, yes, can I ask words, please? Yes, hello, yes. Dr. Najjar. How are you? How are nice you? to you. Good, thank you very much. I'm Dr. Najjar from Syria. Thank yes, you I know your, you very well. Uh, thank you for your uh, Thank you, and happy to <laughs> I'll be happy, happy eat for all. Uh, uh, actually, um, I want to, to, to know the, the number of, of the cases that you, that you did it by endoscopy and the, by the open micro neurosurgery. And yes. what is the number in each calcification of the anterior Monroe and the posterior and midline? Yes, Please. a very good question. In fact, my experience with endoscopy is only with nine cases. Nine cases I only did endoscopically. Then I changed to microsurgical transcalusal approach. The whole cases is 52. The whole transcalusal approach is 52. Uh, 31, it is an open Monroe. I can give you the statistics. I can deliver to you if you send to me your email. 
or I can put it on the zoom, the total uh, uh, classification system of based on how many classes, how many types. Uh, I have uh, 31 open Monroe and I have uh, five closed Monroe. I have retro fornicial three and, ha and I have, uh, uh, sorry, inter fornicial and I have retro foraminal three. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. My, my, my comment, uh, um, actually I visited uh, Baghdad in 2001 and yeah. I have a lecture for the endoscopy for uh, the brain. It was uh, maybe scientific week or something like that with Dr. Said al watri and others. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, we have a series of 32 uh, colloid cysts. We did it endoscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's published in the book of Professor Osama al-Mufti in the controversy yes. in neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. Dr. Samir al-Baba in his book uh, of uh, Dr. al-Mufti put the uh, chapter of the uh, open uh, micro, uh, micro uh, surgery, and I did the 32 cases of the endoscopy. Actually, yes. most of the cases, in, as in your cases, is anterior to the foramen of Monroe. Yes. And in some cases, with it's just a little bit behind, maybe uh, one, one centimeter, we just mm -hmm. make our borehole more anteriorly. So mm -hmm. we, uh, your uh, classification is very important, uh, even for the people who are, we, who are working with the endoscopic. Uh, endoscopy, yes. Uh, yeah. So your, your experience far exceeds my experience in endoscopy. In fact, I did only nine cases endoscopically, and um, uh, perhaps it is my fault. Uh, I don't have great experience in endoscopically. I felt less free, uh, and when I faced bleeding, um, I, I found in my hands difficult to control the bleeding when I did it endoscopically. And in nine cases, I have two recurrences in the nine cases that I did endoscopically. I, I know that these cases are very little to have judgment. It is very precocious uh, uh, judgment. But in my hands, um, in fact, I have no good experience in endoscopic procedure. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the point that when you uh, uh, puncture the cyst, yes. even you go endoscopy or microsurgery, you see the wall is collapsing. This yes. means that the, all the, wall, the wall of the colloid cyst is never attached to the wall of the third ventricle. The yes. main attachment is the origin. And yes. the origin from the uh, uh, roof of the third ventricle Mm -hmm. If you uh, read the article of Bro uh, Professor Rotton, it mm -hmm. uh, consists of five layers. Yes. Actually, the colloid cyst is arranging from the tinea choroida, which is different layer of the internal uh, cerebral vein. Yes. So it's rarely to have a, 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 a severe addition to this vein. That's what may make a mass... Uh, I make uh, maybe about nine or 10 cases in a block resection totally. We take mm -hmm. it with the endoscope outside with, uh, with uh, um, just minimal invasive, uh, as you know. Yes, I think it is a small colloid cyst, but uh, you know that we are facing- Actually uh, less uh, than two centimeters, yes. Yes. In diameter. Yes, yes. most of the, our cases are large colloid cysts. They, you know that mm -hmm. some of our patients are neglecting themselves. They are only very lately with very large colloid cysts. So in a block, uh, delivery of the colloid cyst, I think you do agree with me, is rather dangerous. Yeah. If it Thank is larger you. than two centimeters. Yes, you can, you can bend trick and, and you, you will make some manipulation with the, with the wall or you will shift to the microsurgery. Yes. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Jara. You. Appreciating Thank your you. comments. Very nice. Yeah, I will send you my email. I will be... Uh, Please do. And I will say, I will yeah. say you my own statistics. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Jara. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalal, for your question. Uh, Dr. Adnan, we have another question from um, Dr. Uh, Alwash. He's saying, in close moral type, may endoscopic approach is better or not, and how we differentiate it in a radiological study? Yes. I told Dr. Ahmed that radiologically it is rather difficult, even in the hands of the best neuroradiologist, to tell you whether this colloid cyst closing the Monroe or is opening the Monroe in the classical fashion. So if you have a closed Monroe colloid cyst, I think this question should be delivered to the people that are using the endoscope more than me. But to me, it's rather very difficult, if not impossible, because once you puncture the ventricle, what you will see is just swollen fornix. And endoscopically, you have no way of retraction. You have no lay retractors endoscopically. In the endoscope, there is no retraction. The whole concepts of endoscope based on retractorless 
surgery. You have no retractors in the endoscope. And the closed monoloculate cyst, the prerequisite is that you have to have a gentle retraction of the fornix away from the head of cardiac nucleus in order to open the monro. So if you have no retraction, how you can proceed endoscopically? So to the best of my knowledge, if you're faced in the closed monoloculate cyst, you have to switch to the uh, microscopic uh, type because the only thing that you are seeing is a swollen uh, fornix that is closing the monro and you have one alternative endoscopically is to damage the fornix. And this, I think it is not accepted even when you are on the right side. So uh, for this reason, because you are might facing the closed monro, if you are facing it during the endoscopic procedure, then you have to switch to microsurgical transcalusal approach or transcortical. Thank you so much, Dr. Adnan. Another question mm -hmm. from Dr. Mustafa. Yes. He said, good evening, sir, and Eid Mubarak for you and for all participants. Thank you. And thank you for such fantastic webinar. And I want to ask whether you use EVD in case of hydrocephalus pre-op in your cases and whether you need to use unilateral or bilateral EVD and is it necessary to use it or not? Yes, very good question. In fact, when I doing intraventricular tumors, vascular, I routinely put ATV, EVD, sorry. But in the case of colloid cyst, I never put EVD because, as Dr. Jalal said, it is avascular. You should never leave blood behind you. If you are not leaving blood, if you open the pathway, the third ventricle, then there is no, necess no need, and not necessarily, to put external ventricular drain. So in the colloid cyst, in all of my cases, 52 cases, I never use uh, external ventricular drain, neither unilateral nor bilateral because I'm dealing with a vascular structure. After the operation, I follow the patient. The majority, they don't need shunt. In the minority, two cases I have, they need uh, shunt because for one reason, the aqueduct is closed and you have to put shunt for them. The ETV is not useful when you have hydrocephalus because the third ventricle is rather slit and narrow and you have a thick floor of the third ventricle. So if you have a hydrocephalus post-op, then I think the best solution for them is shunt rather than endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So going back to your question, whether I'm using external ventricular drain, no, because there are avascular lesions. Thank you so much. Another question from Maria Elena, Dr. Maria. Uh, he said, what about the timing for surgery? Have you got cognitive deficit in your patient? Um, in population because of the phonics, in pop because of the phonics. Yes, timing of surgery as early as possible. I will not putting them on the waiting list. I have waiting list for patients, but we have priorities for vascular and for colloid cyst. I will immediately operate the, on them. Of course, if they are presenting to be drowsy or severe headache or vomiting, I consider them urgent. I will operate immediately. If he is a rather semi-stable, I will put him on the short list and I will operate him as soon as possible, once he will be ready. I operated on colloid cyst at the middle of night when the patient is comatose. Okay, uh, then Dr. Mohammed said, um, have you ever encountered any complications apart from amnesia? Yes, I encountered, in fact, the most dreadful complications is infection. I have two cases that they have infection post-op, and this is uh, treated by antibiotics, and uh, I put for them because of infection, not because of the, uh, the colloid cyst, and this happened only two weeks after the operation. I put external drain, and I give them heavy antibiotics, and then dissolve. The amnesia is uh, one of the important complications I faced. One of the patients, I have focal epilepsy, and then it is resolved in a matter of three uh, months. But most dreadful complication, in fact, most fearful for me is infection, ventriculitis, and it happened in two patients. So you have to work in strict aseptic technique. Even you should more be strict than doing VP shunt because ventriculitis is disastrous if it happens in the background of colloid cyst. Of course, it's bacteria, not chemical, because it's difficult for the chemical contents of the colloid cyst to slippage from your hands. You can aspirate it immediately. But in two cases, after two weeks, 
I faced with features of ventriculitis that's treated with antibiotics. Okay, another one uh, from Dr. Saif. Uh, thank you, sir, for thank you all for your work. I want to ask mm -hmm. if he, if the associated hydrocephalus is a rigid indication for the endoscopic approach. No. No, of course, if you have hydrocephalus, uh, it's uh, a prerequisite for endoscopic approach. If you don't have hydrocephalus, there is no way to go endos endoscopically. If you have hydrocephalus and if you have good experience, go endoscopically, but you have to depend on, I can say, luck that you will face an open Monroe colloid cyst. If you face a retroforaminal, or if you face an interfornicial, or if you face a closed Monroe, even when you have a hydrocephalus, then you will be in a real trouble. So hydrocephalus is a prerequisite for going endoscopically, but not always a hydrocephalic patients with colloid cysts predict successful endoscopic surgery. Thank you so much, Dr. Adnan. And Dr. Joanna saying thank you, Professor, for a really thorough presentation and uh, operation mm -hmm. tips. Yes. So I don't know if there is any other question. I have also one question yes. uh, about uh, how do you take care of the content of the cyst spreading into the third ventricle? Uh, maybe it can also go up to the fourth ventricle. How do you, uh, how do you take care of that? Yes, very, very good question. In fact, you should be very careful when you open the colloid cyst. You should open it in a very small fashion. You should not open it radically. Open very small incision. And when you open it with scissor, you should make the sucker close to your scissor so that you should be careful not to let any contents of the colloid cyst to slip away from your sucker. Once the form of Monroe is open, then immediately introduce a patty in the third ventricle because the contents of the colloid cyst is very sticky to the patty. I put the content on the patty in an experiment and I show that all of the contents, they are very sticky to the patty. Of course, you have good quality patty, for example, Codman's patty. Then when the contents accidentally slip to the third ventricle, it will stick to your patty. After you resect, then you can explore the region with very copious irrigation. And then in this way, uh, I think you don't have any problem with of the contents into the third or lateral ventricle. So open a little. Put your sucker close to your opening. Try to. Insert a patty or patties, not one, two, three patties, behind the uh, colloid cyst in the third ventricle. So this patty will clear the pathway for you. Thank you so much. One more question from uh, Dr. Dralia Kram. What is the general limitations of endoscopic approach? Well, I think the general limitations, if you have a small ventricle, I have uh, four cases with uh, slit ventricle colloid cyst, symptomatic, severe papilledema, but slit ventricle. No way of endoscopically, because the endoscope sheath is too large to be hosted in the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. So one of the limitations is that if you have small ventricle. The second limitation, if you have a hyperdense colloid cyst, because hyperdense in CT scan means that you have a very thick, very hard contents of the uh, colloid cyst. And the only tool that you have in endoscopically is this transparent catheter that you aspirate the contents of the colloid cyst. If the contents are thick or sometimes even stony, then you cannot be removed by the colloid, by the endoscopic procedure. So uh, uh, hyperdense colloid cyst small ventricle, I think these are the two major limitations of endoscopy. And third also limitation is your experience. If you are not experienced endoscopically, then you have to go for the classic transcortical or transcalosal microsurgical way. Please, may I ask a question? Of yes. course. Yes, get on. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed Imad, for uh, your presentation. Thank you. Unfortunately, I missed your presentation. I am Dr. Ait Bin Ali from Marrakesh, Morocco. I have Welcome a question. Doctor. Thank you. I have a question about asymptomatic uh, cases. Yes. How, how can we know the ones who will progress? Yes. 
Yeah, this is a very important question. In fact, we are facing in our practice asymptomatic colloid cysts, usually in young female. Uh, based on many studies, if the asymptomatic patient has a colloid cyst, which is more than one centimeter in diameter, then I think you have to go for surgery despite of its lacking of symptoms. If the colloid cyst is less than one centimeter, then you can follow the patient every three months with MRI, which is safer than CT scan. But uh, putting the patient on the list of asymptomatic is rather difficult because some of the patients they are really symptomatic, but you are not digging deep in the history. So uh, in fact, we have questions about the, uh, whether they are asymptomatic or not. Some of the patients they are afraid of home surgery and subconsciously they are saying to you, I have no symptoms. But if you ask a relative of the patients, they will admit that they have morning headache, they have paroxysmal headache, they have sudden dropping attack because it is known that one of the presentation that passed unnoticed by the physician is the dropping attack. Suddenly the patient will lose the power of the legs and he might attribute this to slippage that he just slipped on the rope. No, this is not slippage. This is sudden dropping attack, which is as real symptoms of the colloid cyst. So first, Consider the patient asymptomatic is rather questionable. You have to dig deep in the history, either of the patient or of his relatives. Second, if you have a colloid cyst, which is larger than one centimeter, even when it is asymptomatic, I think it is wise practice to advise the patient for surgery. Even when the patient is asymptomatic, you have to have a good discussion with the patient that there is possibilities, though it is rare, of a sudden death. So if the patient is aware about this point, perhaps he will change his mind. So asymptomatic is rather questionable. If we have a good physicians, good neuromedicine, you know that we are neurosurgeons, perhaps we are listening very little to the patients. We are more concerned about the, the radiology, about the pathology, about the surgical approaches, but taking detailed history from the patients, in fact, I think we are rather uh, uh, retarded in this uh, aspect. The neuromedicine, the neurologists are more adherent to the patient's history than us. So uh, labeling the patient asymptomatic uh, is rather questionable. Uh, one has to pay attention about very subtle manifestations, for example, dropping attack, paroxysmal headache, occasional vomiting that might be attributed to the uh, colloid cyst. And if it is larger than one centimeter, regardless to the symptoms, you have to advise the patient for surgery. This yes. is in my practice. Thank you very much. Can you, can you make uh, more comment about uh, sudden death, please? Yes, it is rather rare. It is recorded in about three to 6%. <clears throat> there is one study of taking uh, 50 patients of colloid cyst, and they noticed that three to 5% of them, they will have sudden death. And they attributed the sudden death to two mechanisms. Either it is sudden closure of the form of Monroe with sudden severe hydrocephalus, or the more likely explanation is that the colloid cyst will stimulate the sympathetic pathways that are located in the posterior part of the third ventricle. And such massive stimulation of the sympathetic system will lead to the sudden death. So it is rare, but it is uh, a real possibility. I have one patient that, have, uh, that, that died in the uh, emergency unit of the neurosurgical hospital, and the postmortem revealed that he has got colloid cyst. And I have one patient presented to me comatose. He was in near death situations and we did emergency shunt for him and then we evacuated, uh, we excised the colloid cyst. So the sudden death is a real possibility, although it is rarely happened in patients with colloid cyst. It's either due to the acute hydrocephalus or to the sudden uh, sympathetic stimulation. Yes, recently I had one case in my department in the yes. university hospital, yes, it's terrible. Yes, it is a real, yes, it is a real problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you, and have a good Eid. Happy Eid. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adnan. That's a brilliant presentation and very educative. Thank uh, you very much. One more question? Yes. From the panelists? Okay, if there is no more questions, Dr. Bennett, it's all yours. Okay, well, there's just one more question, Dr. Kabulo. Uh, what is the general limitations of endoscopic approach? Yes, I think yes, we asked that one. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Doc. We look forward to your presentation next week. Do you have any idea what it might be? Uh, well, till now, we are uh, 
not yet uh, matured the subject, but okay. I will have announcement for you in the next uh, few days. Okay, great teaching, great teaching. I'm glad you reached Thank a lot you. of people, a lot of people. And we'll send you the edited version uh, once we do the edits. And thanks, Thank Dr. You. Cabullo, for moderating, and thanks all the panelists for coming. And we'll see you next week. Welcome. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. I'm happy to eat for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You.